We are here now. Never split the difference. <laughs> finally, finally. Um, I'm on with the American business icon, Mark Cuban. If you, if you probably knew him well before he was on Shark Tank, uh, if he didn't own a team named the Mavericks, they would have to name the team the Mavericks after him. So, Mark, it's a pleasure. I'm going to ask you real quickly, what's your what's your philosophy of negotiation? Well, first, got to know why you're negotiating. What's your goal? Because not every negotiation is the same. You could be no negotiating with one of your kids over whether or not they can have a snack. You could be negotiating over a multi-million dollar deal. It, I mean, they're all different. And so the first step for me is what's my goal? And then from there, my second step is put myself in the shoes of, well, even before that, um, am I prepared, right? Because sometimes you walk into a negotiation and you're cold and other times you've had time to prepare and preparing for me means, you know, how well do I understand the goals of the person um, or people that I'm negotiating with? And once I, you know, understand those two points, my preparation and my goal, then I can start negotiating and it, it tells me what the, um, the slack I have is in my negotiation. All right, that's cool. No, it's very, uh, there's some real classic aspects to that answer. And, the, and one of the reasons why answers like that are classic is because they, they've stood the test of time. But I got a couple of crazy things I'm going to bounce off of you. Sure. So, Fire away. Um, First of all, one, one of our philosophies is that we, that we believe in, that we're very different on the, from the academics on, is that he or she who names price first loses. We hate naming price first. And the academics say you got you to gotta name a price first, you got a high anchor. Now, our philosophy for not doing that is we think we'll, if we anchor too extreme, we'll scare deals, deals away that we should have made. What's your thought on that? No, I, I think it's best if you don't name price first because you make somebody, the more you can get somebody, the more you can understand the thinking and the patterns of the person you're negotiating with, the better, um, the more advantage you have. And so if you can get somebody to name price first, that's always a plus, always. Now that said, sometimes there's a time value of negotiation where you know it's the first step of many. Let's just say, you know, you have to close one deal before you can get on to the second deal. And so if I, if it's just as, if it's just a singular negotiation, I always want the other person or, or party to, to give price first. If it's, you know, one in a cascading deals, then I'm not as opposed to it because I have a bigger picture that probably the person I'm negotiating first with doesn't fully comprehend. All right. All right. That's cool. I mean, well, my son, uh, you know, we got a family business at a Black Swan Group. My son, Brandon, runs a company, and he likes to say situation uh -huh. drives strategy. So you're, you're yep, kind of saying context. That's yeah, context yeah. and situation always drive strategy because otherwise, what's the point? I mean, you know, winning a negotiation, no one throws a parade for winning a negotiation. No one puts money in your bank account for winning the negotiation. You've got There's got to be a bigger goal and you've got to have a strategy to get to that goal and know where the negotiation fits. Ah, all right, very good, cool, yeah, yeah. But then otherwise, see, part of your answer on that I heard on, on not naming price first, you, you're really not listening that much to the boundaries, you're looking for data on how the other side is thinking. Exactly right, um, because again, I'm trying to figure out their strategy, right? Because you gotta assume that the people you're negotiating with are smart. You can't presume that they're, they're they're idiots, right? And if you presume that they're smart, all data is good data. And you got to presume Ooh. that, you know, they've read Chris Voss's book, right? And that they don't want to name price first. And then there's some reason that they are bringing out the price first. And there's some reason why whatever price they threw out there, um, what's the, you know, you want to find, try to figure out the logic behind it. Yeah, all right. So for everybody that's listening just now, there's something to tweet out. That's a quote that I'm going to put out on my Insta on my social media. And, of course, give attribution. All data is good data. I love that, Mark. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah it's true, right? Yeah, because, because, you know, 
any anytime you're selling, right? Whether because people sometimes forget, even selling is a negotiation at some level, and you always want to put yourself in the shoes of the people that you're negotiating with or selling to, to try to understand why they're at the table. You know, why are they here? What are they trying to accomplish? How does it fit to their mission or goal? And in the you know, more data helps you understand that, but the more you understand their perspective, the easier it is to negotiate because you can you can guide them to their goal while knowing what your goals are at the same time and reaching your own goals. Man, I gotta have you come in and talk at one to, to my team. You know, how have you? Because you're saying stuff that I love. Guide them to their goal. I love that. We love the phrase guided discovery. That's kind of what you're talking about, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly right. Um, you know, because if you're dealing with a shoe store, shoe stores have certain goals and, you know, they want to sell shoes. If you're negotiating with the Taliban right now, like some people are, that's a whole different thing, right? And there's more at stake and it's lives at stake and how you negotiate on what you accomplish is, is completely different and the timelines are different. Um, and so you always want to understand the perspective of the, the, the group that you're ne- negotiating with. Listen, I can tell you something. Now that you mentioned one of my favorite social uh, fraternity, fraternal organizations, the Taliban, I think uh, <laughs> I think they should send you and me, and we'll go negotiate with the Taliban, and they'll give us back the five thousand prisoners that the Trump administration right? released. We'll get them back and put them back in jail. What do you think of that? I'm good with that. I'm good with that. You and I have come to an agreement, Chris. <laughs> All right, so I, I got I got two tough ones coming at you. So I got I got a I got a philosophy on the way Mark Cuban handles himself. I've been looking forward to bouncing this off you. Okay. So I I watch you know like every other American I watch Shark Tank religiously. And you there's mean Friday a nights on ABC. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when is that again? Can you tell us again when is that? Yeah, Friday nights ABC, eight p.m. Eastern, seven p.m. Central. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, just so trying to get the data into the negotiation. We we got we got to get that out there. We got to we got to make sure because actually, all, all the different sharks. When we're coaching people in negotiation, we tell people to listen to all the different because because of your style and to pick up the style. So you're in a, you negotiate. You sound like an assertive, and your favorite move. Although I love this answer to your favorite move. Once your favorite move is to say, "Here's my offer." Take it or leave it before you talk to anybody else. I see Mark Cuban do that yep. all the time. And yep. then, yep. see, yep. in my view, that's testing your counterpart. And one of the entrepreneurs looked back at you and said, you wouldn't want me to get pushed around by that if I was negotiating on, on your behalf, would you? And you sat back and you went, no, I no, I wouldn't. And what I loved about that is I think – you are constantly testing people to see how they will stand up on your behalf. Oh, of course. You know, but also, yeah, on my behalf, on their own behalf, right? Because, you know, as an entrepreneur and they're running a business asking me to invest, it's there's, there's multiple layers going on in Shark Tank. On one layer, I have to try to understand what the entrepreneur is about and how they do business. And on the other hand, I've got to, you know, hopefully win the deal if, if I'm interested in it. And, you know, but I always know I always have the advantage over the other sharks. And part of it's TV. So there's also another layer, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, what's good television? And so, you know, when, when I'm testing them and saying, okay, you have a 24 second clock where well, you have to give me an answer right now, it's, it's a test to see, okay, did you come in looking for me? Did you come in looking for the best deal? How are you going to be able to stand up to situations when, you know, your back's against a wall or you're tested? Um, and then how do you, how quickly can you think on your feet? Because that's the other, another um, talent of good entrepreneurs. They're quick and they understand. And look, you know, as an entrepreneur, if they haven't thought this through already in their mind and haven't watched the show, that means that they're not very good at preparation. So there's all these layers that I'm kind of evaluating simultaneously. Uh, that's cool. And part of preparation is being prepared to get punched in the nose and see how you react, right? Yeah, you know what Mike Tyson said, Ed, right? You know, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. And, you know, it's, it's amazing how telltale uh, or how easy it is to 
determine whether or not someone is prepared. Um, you know, you can ask them basic questions. You can ask them, you, you know, you, you could throw trial closes at them that you've used before and just looking to see if they've watched the show, right? Because if you're coming in looking for a deal and, you know, you're so arrogant, you think you don't watch the show, you don't have to watch the show, that tells me volumes. And, and so, you know, you can do all these little tests to find out how prepared the other party is because that lets you know, again, you know, about what your strategy can be. Wow. 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 That, that, that's awesome. <laughs> I'm going to go back and, and get the transcript of this just so I can take notes from it. <laughs> what, uh, how is Mark Cuban negotiating in business different than Mark Cuban negotiating in his personal life? Um, well, usually, <laughs> this is going to sound arrogant, but, you know, in, in my position, you know, people are coming to me for something rather than me having to go to them for something. And that's changed 180 degrees from when I first got, got started. And then in my personal life, you know, I, I'm usually negotiating with an 18-year-old or 15-year-old daughter or a 12-year-old son. And so I'm always at, at a disadvantage with them because they don't care, right? They're going to do what they want to do no matter what. Um, more often than not. But, you know, what I can say is like when I first got started and nobody knew who I was and, you know, I had a company, Micro Solutions. I, w I was sleeping on the floor when I started a company of, with five roommates and I had no leverage on anything. The, the only advantage that I ever could have um, or advantages were one, I would outwork people and two, I would out prepare. You know, I, I always looked at technology or negotiating in business as as a game of attrition in some respects that, you know, with like, like I said earlier, you know, data is everything. And I would spend however much time I needed to, to find out everything that I possibly could about who, you know, the company I'm selling to or negotiating with, because that's how, you know, if, if I was going to get their confidence to let them know that I was prepared, it had to be because I showed that I had done the preparation had done the work um, to, to be, be at the table and, you know, try to convince them of something or get to a point that I needed to get to. Uh, you keep, you, there's a word you keep using and I can tell that you really like it's preparation. Yeah, always, you know, um, you know, there, I went to Indiana university and there, there was a long time coach by the name of Bobby Knight that old school, old school college basketball fans will remember. And it, what he used to say, and, and I'll never forget it is, um, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit is everybody's got the will to win, but it's only those with the will to prepare that do win. And, you know, if you think about sports, you know, one of the lines I like to use with the Mavericks is practice to you can't get it wrong. And the same applies to business, you know, practice to you can't get it wrong. Do the things that you need to do to be ready in your business so that when the pressure's on, it's all, you know, you, you already know that you're prepared. And because when you're prepared um, and you've done the work, it's not stressful. And if you're not stressed, no matter what the circumstances are and whoever you're negotiating with or whatever the terms are or whatever's at stake, if you're prepared, you're prepared and, and you're going to be able to negotiate. Because I can't tell you, and I'm sure you've experienced the same thing, Chris, where I've sat at negotiating tables and there was a lot at stake for the other party. And you could tell they were nervous or you could tell they were scared. Or you could tell that if they didn't get the deal, they were out of business or, you know, something important couldn't happen. And when you're prepared, you can you you can ignore those things. If it's you that you're facing going out of business, if it's you facing bankruptcy, if it's you facing losing something critically important, if you're prepared, you, your your preparation takes over and that allows you to to perform during the negotiation. All right. So, but preparation, I mean, that, that's kind of a general term that, that, that almost by definition, like what is preparation? Am I doing push-ups? Am I stretching? I mean, what exactly? <laughs> yeah. What, all the above. The steps? Um, so the steps are, why am I there? Right. Who am I talking to? And even more why, than why am I there is why are they there? You know, what is their goal? And once I have an understanding of what their goal is, then dig in and learn everything that I can. You know, if, um, oh, I'm trying to pick it. If I'm negotiating with a free agent for the Dallas Mavericks, you know, um, what, you know, why are they there? Is it just money? 
because there's going to be times when I can't offer as much money as another team. Is it about living, you know, circumstances? Is it about play, you know, minutes on the team? You know, what is the goal for that player? And it's the same if I'm negotiating a supplier or whatever it may be. What are they trying to accomplish? And the more I understand about what their goal is, then the more I can tailor my presentation to what what they like and what's interesting to them. And then you, if you can get that connection, you can get to a yes. How, much, how, how important is it to understand their emotional drivers? Oh, it's 100 percent. That's part of the preparation. You know, again, why are they there? What you know, what's at stake for them? Um, what's you know, what's going to happen if they go back to the office without a deal? What what is this? You know, where? What is the position of the company financially? Um, the culture of the company? All those things are critically important to understanding. Um, you know who you're dealing with in a negotiation. All right, so you got a player. You got to know if the player wants to know that he wants to. He, does does he simply want to have score more points than anybody on the team, or does he want to win a championship? Yeah, exactly right. Because not everybody's the same. Some guys, you know, if they're early in their career, they might, you know, think to themselves, "Well, the more points I score, then the more I can make in my next contract." And my primary mission is to make as much money as possible. And then you have other guys, maybe they're later in their career. They said, you know what? I've made a lot of money. My number one goal is to win a championship. So I need to have it conveyed to me exactly how we're going to win a championship this year. Because, not, you know, and you have to be brutally honest with yourself. Not every team that I have every year is in a position to win a championship. No, but all right. So in my opinion, though, I think you are you are more interested in winning championships than a lot of other things that other NBA owners seem to be interested in. Oh, yeah, for sure. But remember, you know, you're not going to automate because there's a salary cap in the NBA. I can't just go to every great player in the NBA and offer as much money as I want to spend. I have, you know, there I have to negotiate within the structure of the salary cap. And that what that leads to is kind of portfolio management, trying to understand how I'm going to get from where I am to winning a championship at some point. And, you know, that isn't just a one-year process. That's always a multi-year process. And there's no template to do it. Otherwise, you know, every team would have multiple championships. It just hasn't turned out that way. Um, we only have one, right? And, you know, we went through a process where, you know, we went through a rebuilding process that, you know, it wasn't too long. It was only three years. And now we're back on the path of winning the championship. But you have to go through that process and understand, you know, where you are in the process and how to get to the end goal. All right. Very cool. Well, we're starting to talk about a couple of things that are intertwined, which is culture and core values. We think that culture, yep. core values drive negotiation strategy. What are the core values that drive Mark Cuban's negotiation strategy? Um, candor. Um Really, I mean, honesty, being authentic. I don't come in trying to put on a show to, you know, look at the shiny object over here. Let me mislead you to, um, to try to get, you know, you to buy the shiny object. It's more, okay, look, you know, here's what I'm trying to accomplish. You know, in, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, you know, I, I'm prepared. I know what you're trying to accomplish. Let me tell you how my goals intertwine with yours. And that allows us to get there. So candor, authenticity, um, being straightforward, um, being honest, because you don't want to, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of honesty um, because you don't want to get caught in the middle of a lie or misrepresenting something and then have to explain yourself and then have everything be called into question. And, you know, if, if you'll allow me to do a little bit of color commentary on what I heard in your answer, sure. because of what I love about it. First of all, you said candor or honesty more than once. And I, I will tell you, since I left the government, we've been doing private sector negotiations across the board. There are so many people that are afraid to be honest because they don't know how to be honest. And you said it like three times. Yeah. So that I, mean, I would I would have to say that was your I don't know one. how you don't know how to be honest. Right. I mean, I can see people being afraid to be honest because it, it shows some level of vulnerability. But I'm, I'm never afraid of vulnerability, right? Because if you're negotiating with somebody good, or if I'm negotiating with somebody, I know your vulnerabilities. 
you know, I've done my homework and I'm presuming, you know, mine. And so I'm not going to lay everything on the table. You try to hold some things back at some layer, level, but I'm not afraid to show any level of vulnerability. That's part of being honest. There's another tweet for everybody listening to put out. Mark Cuban says, don't be afraid to be vulnerable. I mean, that that's especially with the misinterpretation, you know, because people, I, you know, I, I don't agree with the word, but, you know, some of your other sharks accuse you on Shark Tank of being a bully. I don't see you a bully as being a bully at all. <laughs> no, I mean, it's just because I'm confident, you know, and it's just, you know, I I don't have to BS, right? It's just like, okay, here it is. And if that, you know, if, if the other sharks are coming from a, a relative position of weakness, then it's going to come across as being a bully. But the reality is I'm, I'm just being straightforward. I'm being honest. I'm being authentic. I don't pull any punches. And if I don't know something, I'll tell you, I don't know it because that's okay because you can't, you know, I think this goes back to what you were saying about some people being afraid to be honest. You know, they're afraid that if they say the wrong thing, they'll appear to be vulnerable. Um, and look, you're going to be in negotiations sometimes where you are vulnerable and it's going to be really honest. You're vulnerable. I mean, every startup or most startups have been in the situation where, you know, they've seen what their burn is and they see how much cash they have in the bank and they know they only have a runway of X number of months. And they're sitting at the negotiating table trying to pretend that that's not the case. That never works. You know, your VC has looked at your your numbers and they, they see it. As an investor, I've looked at startups and I've seen it, and I know this is your vulnerability. And if you don't admit to it, then I'm going to be more concerned, and I'm going to have, you know, questions about whether or not you truly understand the position you're in. All right, I know we got about an, another minute. I know you got a hard out, so it's sort of the last comment in when what I heard you say that I, that I'm just inspired by is you talked about. You said whether our goals intertwine, which to me designates you as a negotiator who wants to win with people as opposed to at their yes. expense. Yeah, I never try to win at someone else's expense. I mean, look, there are going to be times when someone's fucked with me and I want to embarrass the hell out of them. <laughs> That's right, just, right. But it's rare, right? That's just rare. And, and the reality is 99.99% of the time, I want them – you know, it's the old traditional saying, right? I want them to feel like they got something, but they didn't get everything. And I want them to feel the same way about me. And if, I'm, if I've shown my vulnerabilities, that allows them to feel like they got something um, and I didn't get everything as well. And so, yeah, I, I, I try to, you know, do win-win negotiations because no negotiation is ever my last negotiation, you know, and no business exchange with somebody is hopefully my last negotiation with them because you, you know what you find over a course of a career is the people who are really good that you negotiate with you run into them again because they're really good and they're climbing up the ladder they're accomplishing things they're doing more things and you want them to come away knowing that your brand in a negotiation is you're willing to, to do win-win negotiations because as they do more things in their careers They'll want to come back to you and, and work again. And when you sit down with them, what you find is the negotiations get quicker, 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 and quicker, and more efficient, more efficient, more efficient, because you've done this with them before. And that allows you to grow your, you know, whatever it is you're trying to grow and them do the same. And those types of partnerships and those types of relationships pay dividends for decades. Um, whereas on the flip side, those people who tried to squeeze you for every last penny, you don't want to do business with them, with them ever again. And it turns out that, you know, businesses, you know, life's a long, long time when it comes to business. And they're almost always, it's like karma always plays its role. There's almost always a, a scenario where you're going to run into that person that tried to squeeze you for every penny. And it, you know, you're not going to want to do business with them. And I never want to be that, that person that you don't want to do business with. Wow. Karma always plays its role. Mark Cuban, American business icon. It was a privilege talking with you today, man. Man, I appreciate it, Chris. The, Chris, the questions were great. And um, I'm glad you put me through the process. Now I know what it's like to go through one of your classes or one of your training. Um, so it, it's great. And I, I recommend to everybody to read Chris's book. Um, it's a great read. Um, 
and thanks for having me. Thanks for Fallon. Thanks, um, Fireside. Um, appreciate it, everybody. All right. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, everyone.